Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today we're going to be talking about Faraday cages and how you can protect your electronics from the high impact but realistically low probability event of an electromagnetic pulse caused by a nuclear device. So let's get to it. The main purpose of this Faraday cage was to find a functional way of protecting my Energy Kodiak power generator. I've done numerous videos on this generator. If you go through the link and enter the coupon code Canadian Prepper, you're going to get 20% off the generator. Pound for pound, it's the best lithium ion generator on the market nowadays. So go and check it out. All right, guys. So in the works, I have a mini documentary of sorts that talks all about EMP, which compiles all of the most up to date, credible information and creates a meta analysis for you to best understand the state of understanding of how EMP works, what the risk factors are, and what exactly it might look like. Because there's a lot of mixed messages, there's a lot of misinformation, there's some people who downplay the threats of EMP because they have their own political and economic interests at stake. So in order to get a very objective viewpoint, it's very difficult. So stay tuned for that. It's probably going to be out in a few weeks. Really big video that I've done a lot of research on. And I might even have some guests on that video who are far more knowledgeable about the topic than I am. So today we're just going to talk about this basic Faraday cage I've created. Now, if there was an EMP, the idea is that there's a part of that electromagnetic pulse that they call the E1 and possibly the E2 pulse which is going to fry small electronics, which could potentially fry small electronics. This depends on the intensity of the nuclear device, which is detonated and how specifically that was engineered for EMP. It's going to depend on your proximity to the epicenter of that EMP. And of course, it's going to depend on the types of electronics that you have. Now, you only need a Faraday cage for EMP caused by nuclear devices. You don't need that for the EMP burst caused by electromagnetic storms. That's the E3 portion, which is equally damaging to the grid, I should say, but to smaller scale electronics, the waves are just too big for it to matter. But in the case of high altitude nukes being detonated over the North American content or anywhere for that matter, uh, you're going to want to store your devices in this. So all it is, it's a conductive enclosure. Basically, it's a metal box. The inside is lined with a non-conductive material that you put your stuff into. So none of the stuff in the box actually comes into contact with the metal outside. So an EMP goes off and essentially some of that signal is weakened and attenuated so that the stuff inside here doesn't get fried. Anything outside here could potentially be uh, damaged. So this is an EMP box I made by myself. I wanted something which was practical and functional. You can do the garbage can thing. You can do the ammo can thing. There's a thousand and one ways you can make a Faraday cage. It's just a metal enclosure with a non-conductive liner, essentially. And you put your stuff in that. You can even make it out of aluminum foil if you want to. But the reality is that is not practical and it's not aesthetic. So I don't want to have a trash can in my house. I don't want to cash, carry a trash can full of electronics around in my vehicle. I want something which is accessible. So I picked up this thing from Pr Princess Auto. Basically, it's just an aluminum container. It's uh, the cheap kind of diamond plated stuff, which really isn't even diamond plated. It's some knockoff of that, but really cheap sort of aluminum. All you need is an aluminum box. And the real important thing here is that you want a tight seal. There's uh, a guy on YouTube named Dr. Arthur T. Bradley, who's an engineer, works for NASA. Probably one of the more credible people that I've come across to talk about this kind of thing. And he does experiments where he measures the signal inside the box using a spectrum analyzer to measure how much of the signal from outside is getting inside. And he found that if it was not a fully sealed enclosure, like if you had a trash can and the lid wasn't sealed with some sort of conductive gasket, then the 
amount of protection diminishes by almost 65 percent which could mean the difference between a fried and a functional electronic so basically all i did is i bought this uh you know like cheapo aluminum crate like i said and it has black paint on it so what you have to do is uh dremel off or sand off somehow i used a rotary tool just to take off the paint off of the bottom portion here and the inner interior lining of the lid and i added some copper conductive tape now you don't need to use conductive uh, copper tape i should say it's a bit more expensive than the aluminum tape but i figured i would just go overkill because why not if i'm going to go to the lengths of building something like this i want to make sure that it's going to work properly now for the non-conductive inner liner i had some custom molded uh, laser cut foam put in there I, I know a guy who does this, so I basically was able to get it done for free. Uh, this is something that might cost you money if you wanted to have it done, or you could just go and buy some foam, cut it out yourself. Any non-conductive material is going to work, even wood. Uh, making it out of foam, of course, is going to not only bring the weight down, but is also going to create a nice soft receptacle for your electronics and pad them from shock so it's a pretty tight seal but i may still look into getting one of dr arthur t bradley's uh, gaskets that he sells on his website now i have no affiliation with him whatsoever but you can get these gaskets which has an adhesive on one side it has a foam and then it has a conductive aluminum or copper material on the other side that's going to add a nice buffer and ensuring a nice tight seal all around this faraday cage so this is functional i can open it i can close it i don't have to see with a trash can you have to tape the outsides to make sure that's fully enclosed he's also done tests with uh, perforated or uh, mesh type faraday cages which don't protect what's inside as well that rf uh, energy is going to leak through any sort of leaks in the exterior here so the things that i would carry in here uh, i wanted something for my big electronics i recently did a video on this energy kodiak generator easily one of the pound for pound best portable power devices you can get it's the most power in the least amount of weight that you can get on the market super fast charging up to 600 watts input so you can charge this sucker up if you have a full solar panel set up in two to three hours which is just fantastic it has 1.1 kilowatts of stored energy. It outputs uh, 1,500 watts continuous and a 3,000 watt uh, peak output. So you can power power tools, a small fridge, a small freezer, pretty much a lot of the smaller scale stuff, uh, even a microwave, you can power with this sucker. So you can power a lot of things with it. I've done extensive videos. Uh, they're still giving me that 20% off. So if you want 20% off one of these units, I can go get it through the link in the description. I would strongly recommend it just for its portability. And the fact that I can put it in a Faraday cage is kind of cool too. So when I do need it, I can take this stuff out. And that's the thing with this stuff. I can put this cage in my truck. I can leave it at home. You know, and when I need to access the devices out of it, uh, I can do that. I'm not going to just keep all this stuff in here 24 seven. Really, it's, you never know when an EMP is gonna hit and uh, maybe there would be some warning signs that we would get maybe the sirens would go off i mean if you're in the middle of the blast zone you got bigger problems to worry about than protecting your electronics from emp i guess the idea is for 12 hours out of the day when i'm not using this stuff it's in here and it's safe so some of the things that you might put in here are things like that like a small generator um, obviously some of the cords for that there's a uh, power film, my power film solar panels. This is the power film lightsaver solar panel. So that has batteries and solar panels as well. Uh, they say that EMP doesn't affect batteries. However, in the Carenting event in 1859, I believe it was a really significant solar flare event. Uh, one that was so intense that the you could send a telegraph without having any power to the telegraph itself that's how much energy 
was flowing through the air. They, you could see the Aurora Borealis all the way from the equator. If electronics were hooked up to power sources, they would light on fire. So it was a very, very significant event, something that if it happened today, uh, we'd be in big, big trouble. Now, uh, I also carry this genius portable battery charger. So if I needed to charge a, you know, a battery for a car. Now, I know there's a lot of uh, mixed views about whether or not cars will work in e after an EMP. I'm going to address that and a bunch of other things in an upcoming video on EMP. I have in here some data, just memory cards. You might want to get a larger hard drive or something like that. Uh, that just has a, a variety of different survival information on it, survival PDFs, books, videos, things of that nature. A little doomsday library there. Um, just a Baofeng radio. I have a couple two-way radios. These, I just picked these up from Costco, actually. I'm not a big fan of two-way radios because, as most of you know, they don't... You're never going to get the range that a radio like this purports. But these are pretty cool. They're floatable. They have a built-in flashlight. Uh, they have a lot of cool features. You can. It has a battery which is USB rechargeable, but it also takes AA batteries. It's just very rugged. Uh, 56 kilometers range, which means you're probably getting under really crappy conditions, maybe a kilometer range, which is pretty damn good when you think about it. Uh, probably, you know, if in open spaces, you you might achieve. A 10 kilometer range across a lake or something like that but you know you never you always want to take those things with a grain of salt when they say that a couple different flashlight modes there which i think is pretty cool uh, they do float as well so if you were to drop it in water and if you do drop it in water it has a feature in which the light will automatically come on so that's kind of cool i'll uh, post a link for those in the description i have a ktor pocket socket something i haven't really used that much to be honest i reviewed this item a long time ago on the channel and still one of the best items out there in its class basically you can plug it's like a wall socket but it's a charger it's only 10 watts but this sucker will charge things like a wall socket so but it's going to take a lot of exercise it's the pocket socket it's made to be ergonomic and yeah like i say if you want to link to any of this stuff i'll post it in the description i would say you know the pocket socket might be something which is good for a bunker or something like that i don't know how practical it is now if it can really compete with solar power the problem with kinetic energy generators is that they take energy to generate so you're going to have to make sure that you have enough food in reserve in order to make it worthwhile to convert that food energy through kinetics into, uh, you know, a source of energy that you can use for your electronics. Uh, a flashlight. Probably throw a few more flashlights in there. This is my Texoon shortwave weather band FM AM radio. Rechargeable as well. Another shortwave radio, a GPS device, I know. If there was a large-scale EMP, uh, GPS is probably not going to be working, at least the satellites which were overhead when it hit. And a power film 120-watt solar panel. That's the great thing about these foldable solar panels is that they're going to fit in something like this. Now, you could scale this up as big as you want. There's no limit to the side of, size of Faraday cages you can make. Uh, there's people who are making their garages into Faraday cages. In fact... If you have a garage which has a metal exterior already, then basically that in itself is kind of a Faraday cage. Uh, so long as nothing is touching the sides of that building, then that's a Faraday cage. I just thought I would share what I've done for it because like most things, you know, it, a lot of things with do-it-yourself, it, they don't really look that good. And the, the reality is you can do that. But you have to think in terms of practicality when it comes to things like the wife who there was guys on the Berkey water filter video who, that I did who said, oh, you can just make that out of a 10 gallon bucket. But seriously, what do you think your wife's going to say when you make some jerry rigged, you know, uh, 10 gallon bucket or five gallon bucket with uh, charcoal filter 
and you put that set that up on your kitchen counter what do you think she's going to say about that you know what she's going to say about it she's going to say hell no that's got to go so things like this that have a good appearance make sense oh uh we should probably run a quick test on this so most people make the mistake of trying to test their faraday cages using two-way radios dr arthur t bradley explains why that is not a, a valid test because these are made to be very sensitive to the signals so if you are trying to do a test in which you put one of these walkies in here and then you take the other walkie out close the enclosure and then see if you can talk through this one you're always going to uh, get a signal unless you like triple wrap the electronic device and what i mean by that is what you can do you can have a faraday cage within a faraday cage that's going to exponentially increase the amount of attenuation of that signal maybe not exponentially but it's going to have it once again so if this diminishes the signal by 50 percent if i was to put another faraday cage around this that would diminish that by another 50 percent bringing it down to 25 percent of the initial signal let's see here okay so we got this on an fm radio station okay great way to test it out is just to put a radio in there and to see whether or not it picks up the signal. All you hear is static. That's a good sign that this is doing its job. And you can do that same experiment with a wooden container, a plastic container, and you're still going to hear it's still going to be receiving the signal but because this is a faraday enclosure just going to turn it down a bit because this is a faraday enclosure oh back lady bam bam all right so because this is an so because this is a conductive enclosure that signal can't get in and it just turns to static so very simple not really nothing complex about making a faraday cage let me know if you have any ideas for your own like i say ammo boxes work the problem with ammo boxes is that they're only so big so that was a problem for me you can have these custom made i'm working with a guy right now who uh, one of the people who manufactures the bug out rolls for me I'm working with him to try to see if this is something he wants to get into making custom made Faraday cages because uh, they make all sorts of different types of cases. So if you guys think that that's something you might be interested in, let me know and we can examine it. But uh, something like this cost me about 50 bucks and just a little bit of time. So I think it's a good, good deal and it's functional. It's a box, right? I can put this in my truck. I can put it anywhere. So let me know what you think. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Canadian Prepper out.